So, um, to be honest, uh, I'm a little intimidated by all of you people. So, I took this, um, well, usually I take a thesaurus, but I took a King James um, encyclopedia, just in case I need to fill in the awkward silences. So, please bear with me and encourage me. Now that the ice is broken, um, I will explain what I'm here for. So what I'm here for is to tell you a story, to explain a little bit of my personal life, something that changed me and the way I understand about things. I'll generalize a little bit about entrepreneurship, something that is really close to my heart and something that I believe I will try to do for the rest of my life. Uh, I'll talk about biology and law and philosophize, unfortunately, for some of you, about the nature of creating things that which humanity has been fascinated since time X of whenever we spun up from muck. So, when I was only 16, I ventured to open a business, so to speak. We somehow managed to capitalize five, and then, ooh, managed to capitalize around five to 10, and then somehow we derived from angels $50,000. And I was incredibly inspired and uh, unfortunately a little bit naive. My counterparty, my best friend, guided by the ordinate facets of greed and uh, profit maximization, um, rendered all my actions as obsolete. I was no longer a visionary, smart enough, or intelligent enough in order to be able to cope with things and I was kicked off the project. And then was the time when I understood uh, even Bill Gates, perhaps, or um, even the friendship of Hewlett and Packard is now at the time of uh, a certain questioning. So, as you can imagine, I was, uh, or feeling quite betrayed. But then I realized, kind of like YOLO, that <laughs> There are possibilities for these types of mistakes to be understood and to be interpreted. I started to understand the very nature of entrepreneurship, understood that entrepreneurship is institutionalized and created in a certain manner that limits the individuals like myself from creating that of great utility, creating something that can truly change the world. And so I started to question it. But then I started studying IB, and uh, I was educated in, somewhat educated in business and economics. And then I realized that uh, a real entrepreneur, perhaps a historian, or especially an economist, would say that whatever I believe is complete crap. <laughs> that trying to create something from, by some flowery notion that business can change the world is complete rubbish, because we create things from our past experiences. And as such, these very past experiences are ingrained in theory and dogma. <laughs> and because of this, we're limited in the way we can build things. And this is the type of creation I'm talking about. The type of creation that springs out from the desire of an individual to create something great. And I tried to as I thought, think for myself for once. And I ventured and fortunately met a man who was um, a little bit of mentally our age, and unfortunately, or fortunately for me, a very famous entrepreneur, um, an economist, and a horse rider. Um, with this man, um, he took me under what is called apprenticeship, or I like to believe that it was apprenticeship. And he told me this one thing that I believe changed the way I think about things now. He told me, Sai, you should never be afraid of acting against society because then you will never be able to create, you will never be able to become a visionary and do what you truly love and hope for and strive. So this man later told me, let's go and open a business. I said, why, let's not do it. It's crazy, I'm 16 and I have no idea about this sort of stuff. And he said, let's go and do it. So we decided to open a project in Gambia, 
which would work as an educational institution that uh, receives revenues from industrial uh, agriculture. Somehow, now this man, we are feeding around 350 kids and educating 90. And, well, the other business, to slight happiness, miserably failed. And this is the type of creation I'm talking about, creation that acts around boundaries and around convention, that by the very nature of our theme, the TEDx AS, knowledge without boundaries, this should allow us to shift dogmatic thinking and to allow for independent reflection. So that at the end of your IB, when you're told, ladies and gentlemen, you now have two hours to write this paper, you don't simply spew out all that's been beaten into you and all that you've been well, trying to learn, but rather you should recognize the fact that there are certain things outside the conventional box of thinking, things that are far more of greater value and importance to you as an individual, things that allow you to create. So what I'm here for is uh, not to tell you that our knowledge is boundless, much rather I'm here to say that our knowledge is superimposed and is contrived to exist in certain boundaries that we have created over a long time. We live in what I like to say a self-centered place, and we are by own regard anthropocentric, that is self-centered and self-assured humans who try to pride themselves in fabricating meaning about ourselves and the universe. And this is most evident from those old and ancient conceptions of even God, or as St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica said, uh, we comprise the worldview, a hierarchical state, a certain system that places us within the cosmos. We are then in an existence where we're all part of some superfluous and emergent process, <laughs> a clumsy and yet comfortable con justification for the world's uncertainties. So then, one comes to question, one comes to victimize, and well, one comes to become victimized by these very boundaries, by political impositions, by perhaps economic conditions that try to create something common, try to explain the human psyche, and try to explain the individual and quantify him. And this is most evident in the West, where we inherit the idea of law from those old and ancient conceptions as Alan Watts would say, <coughs> conditions, old and ancient conceptions that pass down into science, where we discuss laws of nature. And as such, these laws of nature, or one recognizes that they're simply observed regularities in the way things behave. And you, in order to observe these regularities, have to look at them through something regular that is placing a metaphorical ruler alongside them. But Clocks and rulers are human creations. How can you trust your judgment when only a, hundred, a couple of hundred years ago, you said that the planet was flat and the universe revolved around our very planet? We are so pretentious and conceited in our very existence. We live in the parallels of dogma and pragmatism and emerging from muck, theory, and then law comes to shape the ambiguity we exist in. We are regarding ourselves and thinking where we stand now. Um, I would say we stand in a pale dot in the amorphic darkness of the unknown, with only rigid theory to cast light on our very thoughts. And in our very pursuit of knowledge, we have miserably failed. We are simply the planet of the idiots. And not all is such miserable. Um, for example, you would consider yourself as without a catalyst, as Terence McKenna would say, without a catalyst to say what has never been said before, to see what has never been seen before, to create, to build, to draw, to write what has never been done before. And then you're told that you're unimportant. You're told that you're peripheral, to get a degree, to get a job, to, get, to bast on those fruits of capitalism that we've been previously talking about, and you simply become a consumer you become encapsulated in this glass box of the very boundaries of knowledge. So this is most evident in academia and in education, where we as students are regarded as sixes and sevens, fives and fours, threes and twos, or in certain cases, ones, 
which is <coughs> quite unbelievable. Um, public and private education has then come around to explain our very being um, for the economic conditions of the Industrial Revolution and for the cultural and intellectual developments of the Enlightenment. And this, I would say, is a slightly old model to understand us individuals. The engineers of creation have uh, tried to meet the present and the future the way they have done it in the past. And so they marginalize all those things that are so damn important for us and all those things and all those children, <laughs> I apologize, and, and all those children who try to find this interest and create for themselves. So then we come to question public education or private education or education in general. And we realize that it asks for a certain standardization, a standardization that spawns on from being fixated on cultural and social degrees and on a certain ability that comprises the, what we like to call the intellectual model of the mind. And this intellectual model of the mind is uh, unfortunately a little faulty, I would say. It thinks about real intelligence in degrees of uh, simply the ability to possess knowledge, the ability to be indoctrinated with it, instead of the ability to create it, the ability to change it, and some degree of deductive reasoning. And this is called academic ability. And what does academic ability do then? Academic ability creates a divide between those people who have this academic capacity and those people who do not. And so hundreds and thousands of kids think that they're no longer smart because they're regarded by a certain way of thinking, by a certain way of understanding knowledge, which I'm here obviously to say I'm against. I think that you should all try to think differently. As entrepreneurs, as creationists, as lawyers, as whatever you endeavor to do with your life, try to shift this dogmatic thinking. Try to be hungry, try to question, try to live devoid these very boundaries so that you can become what is called a creator. And in doing so, you can understand that the boundaries of knowledge are truly unlimited as long as you allow them to be so. Thank you.